Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Elevate your practice with PCC. 40 plus years of trust, an award-winning EHR, seamless operations, and financial stability. Use practice analytics to regain control of your practice and learn to maximize billing and reimbursement. When you start with PCC, you get more than an EHR. As an active participant in the pediatric community, we're proud to offer a lively peer community of PCC EHR users, a free annual users conference, and new resources that empower you to prioritize your patients. Learn more at PCC.com. Again, PCC.com. Well, hello, George, and it's Tuesday afternoon for a change. Yeah, Dr. Bravissimo, you're finally back. We're back on the podcast. I was getting bored doing podcasts without you. Today Mm -hmm. we have a pediatric legend, Dr. Russ Libby. And his topic for today is going to be Beyond the Stethoscope, Russ Libby's Pediatric Legacy Unveiled. Should be very interesting. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Russ Libby, a shared friend, STEAM mentor, and accomplished pediatrician. Our shared journey in pediatrics has fostered a lasting friendship and allowed us to collaborate on pivotal issues concerning pediatric care. Dr. Libby's commitment to his patients is truly admirable, and it's an honor to have him on the podcast today. Welcome, Russ, my dear friend. Thank you, Herb. It's great to be here. And of course, it's nice to know that I'm not just a legend in my own mind. Uh, <laughs> and that I have some others who might think of me that way. But uh, it's always a pleasure. And you know, uh, I value our long term relationship and friendship. And uh, certainly, George, it's good to uh, have spent some time with you other than just on the listserv for SOPAM for yeah. all those years. Yep. Um, Ross, we always ask the same question of our guests. Why did you become a pediatrician? You know, it, it is, I think, a, a virtuous and rather symbolic um, commitment. And that be, uh, growing up in the 60s, I was looking for something I could do that would be of value, that would make this world a better place. And I went through a lot of artistic explorations and came to realize that uh, there was more to learn before I could really make a good contribution back and becoming a physician might be an effective way to do that. And I came to realize also that there was no massive way to do anything of meaning, but if I could touch one individual at a time and help them find their way to be the best they could be, then I made a good contribution to the future of our world. And that's really what has driven me as many pediatricians were much more altruists uh, than necessarily realists. <laughs> yeah. Um, you started Virginia Pediatric Group in Fairfax. What was it like to be an entrepreneur and start a whole pediatric practice back in 1982? So I came from that, let's say, uh, physician legend 1.0, which meant that it was a very paternalistic and very, um, let's say, effort-driven endeavor, one that you took all of the responsibilities without ever questioning what you had to do to be a good doc. So back then it was 24 seven, seven days a week, covering all the hospitals that uh, we provided care at, um, starting in the morning, making rounds, seeing my sick and newborn patients in those hospitals, uh, getting to the office, doing a phone hour for an hour to be able to follow up or create opportunities for appointments or quick solutions. And then thereafter, staying until the last patient was seen, going home, trying to have dinner, spend some time with the kids. And if I got called, uh, coming back to the ER, coming back to the hospital, coming back to the office to take care of patients. It was a time when we didn't have inhaled asthma medicines. You used epinephrine subcutaneously. Gosh, uh, you know, you could go on and on, but it was a very labor intensive and fully consuming existence. And you had to be resilient. And if you weren't, there was something wrong with you back then. And your office at that point must have been all on paper. Everything ran on paper. Oh, yeah. No, I had, I had 
one individual who was my receptionist, my nurse, my lab tech, and my uh, bookkeeper. Uh, that was how it worked back then. We had a ledger um, <laughs> and everything was fee for service. Uh, at some point we decided, you know, we we're getting stiffed on enough. We should uh, collect at the time of service. That was a big decision. Uh, of course, then came uh, the nineties when managed care came into play and we started to just have to collect co-pays and we could uh, get a, uh, a contracted rate that was often better than we were collecting at that time in the office. Wow. And I think the progress notes, you had like 20 visits on one piece of paper, the oh, yellow paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. It was <laughs> it was acronyms. Yeah. For instance, if, I did a two month, if I did a two month checkup on you or a four month or a six month, it said NG and D. And what then that sound for? NG. normal growth and development. Oh, <laughs> and then the plan was whatever vaccines you were getting. And then mm -hmm. I circled them on the super bill and. That would be that. Yeah. And there weren't as many vaccines back then either. No, it was an evolution of vaccines that were added uh, certainly sequentially. And of course, initially, I was not able to enjoy the Hib and Prevnar vaccines. And through that course of years, if you had a febrile six month old who was croupy, you had to take him to the OR, make sure they didn't have hemophilus influenza, yes. um, epiglottitis. If, uh, they had been vomiting and had 104 fever and they were six months. You almost invariably did an LP to make sure they didn't have bacterial meningitis. Um, it's remarkable how much we take for granted that those vaccines can do to avoid unnecessary and really uh, uh, terrible interventions uh, to diagnose and treat kids. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And how big is the <laughs> practice now and what is better and what hasn't changed? Well, through the course of time, uh, it was really a relief to add other clinicians because then I could divide call, overnight call, which was always answering the phone whenever it rang or having a beeper from which you would call your answering service and then answer that call. But nonetheless, to be able to share call, to be able to share hospital rounds, to actually get a day off or two during the week. Uh, from time to time to be able to take vacations without arranging external coverage. But over that course of years, uh, we added three more offices and now we're counting about 20 clinicians, uh, two and a half of us doing telemedicine full time and the rest in the variety of offices uh, in the usual way. And you still, you still have a newborn hospitalist for the group but otherwise you've turned everything over to the hospital. Yeah, that was a hard thing for me to do, but my, let's say, and I was involved in, a, in, in leadership at the hospital when they decided that they would hire hospitalists. And to me, that was, oh my God, you mean you're going to take this away from me and you're going to have some extended residency program here? Um, it was not something I was particularly happy about. And uh, I like taking care of patients who are sick. And certainly at uh, Innova Fairfax, where we had our children, we had residents, we had hospitalists in intensive care, be it NICU or PICU. It was an easy, easy way to take care of your patients when they were ill. And it was a meaningful way for you to, to, to be their physician. But nonetheless, we gave that up probably five or six years ago now. And just recently, the same a uh, physician said, we can't deal with the traffic anymore. It is uh, gridlock. It's taking time away from our ability to provide care in the office. And uh, there's so much inefficiency in going to the hospital. We don't want to do new wards anymore. And of course, I think that that's something they should control and manage themselves. I have some other ideas and would love to see them continue to do that. But they have in the last month decided that we will end our hospital uh, newborn care uh, at the first of the year. So I'm working on some alternatives. I think that uh, doing something through a telemedicine visit when a patient is uh, in the hospital, when your newborn's in the hospital, uh, could be some intermediate uh, method by which you can make that connection and uh, create the, rep the, the repertoire that you need to carry on. Wow. You know, Dr. Libby, 
you, you, you both can probably understand this. How many times you'd go into a college checkup right. and the mother with a tear in her eye say, do you know Dr. Rogue was the first one to examine you when you were born 18 oh, years ago? Agreed, 100%. Yes. It happens all the time. Does right. it have any financial value? Zero dollars. Right. But it is priceless. Right. I call that currency of the heart. You yes. know, there are some specialties where it's all in your pocket. Yeah. For us, it's mostly in our hearts, right? Yeah. But you know what? This is why they 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 come to us because we still go there, we still engage, we still, right. you know, you don't have to be there all the time. And if there's a lot of people to cover the hospital, so what? You go once a week. What's the big deal? I agree yeah. wholeheartedly. I haven't been going for a few years, so I, I, I can understand to, if that's what they designed, right? I have to push back because from yes. a, a young pediatrician's point of view especially in Northern Virginia, where there's so much sprawl, uh -huh. you, you might live in Aldi, Virginia, and it's 30 miles to Fairfax. And if you have to drive to just see one newborn, yeah, and then drive back to your office 30 miles back, it's 45 minutes to an hour there and 45 minutes to an hour back. And you've lost at least three, if not four hours of your day. Yes. And, you know, and then you're behind and there's not enough appointments for everybody needs to see you. And at least in, in our geographic area, with the way the traffic is and the sprawl, um, it is really difficult to cover all the hospitals that deliver babies and do it in an efficient manner. Yeah, no, you are absolutely 100% correct on that. But in our geographic area, where we have to drive by the hospital to get to the office... It's pretty yeah. stupid not to go. Different. Right. And that was the that was the really old model of the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. So all the offices were within really, I mean, you could run to the delivery room from your yeah. office. Well, they used I mean, to do that. Yeah. That, yeah, that's, no, that's for sure. You used to have to cover those C sections or those uh, potentially complicated deliveries. Yes. And and three of our offices are actually within half a mile of our one of those individual hospitals. They're, so we would divide up the, the care between the offices. So who was working at the office that was close to that hospital would see the patients there. So that worked, but any which way it is, uh, it is what's evolved and how we deal with it. Uh, I think that there are very few that still go to any of the hospitals, but nonetheless, it's one of those evolutions that we've dealt with. There are other things people don't want to take call. They want to hire a triage service. Um, they uh, will find ways to reduce what was sort of that unlimited commitment that we had back in the day uh, to one that is more amenable to lifestyle and, as they say, work life now. But you do realize that every time you reduce these things, it does reduce income. Yeah, well, that's one of those things that I try to point out as the old office guy, uh, as I try to educate my youngins, if you're going to take one service away, you better find a better and bigger service to replace it. And that's not easy in pediatrics. No. Well, they got to go to the office an hour earlier. They won't do that. They won't do that, right? So, so Raz, you have what I call a child's mind or a growth mindset. Throughout your whole career, it's been amazing how you are able to innovate. Every decade, you change somehow. You've gone from... <laughs> The general has gone into the into the delivery room and to the ER and to admitting your patients and doing spinal taps to becoming an offices to using you're one of the first people in Northern Virginia that actually had an EMR. And now you're a virtualist. How do you keep your mind so young and open to new ideas? You know, I, I think that's the nature of the beast more than anything. Um there's always something to do and always some way to do it better. So, you know, I've always been the one who felt there was no solution. There was only the next problem. And that requires something creative and possibly innovative. Um, but that learning how to identify and then innovate is what gives me energy. Um, and it happens in every facet of my world, whether it be a creative side, seeing uh, George's guitars in the background and you know, just sort of putting myself in that plane where you meditate when you're 
your fretboard, uh, or if it's reading an article and getting stimulated to think about what does that mean and what can we do from this set of thoughts and principles, um, it just never stops. Maybe it's a, it's a disease, but whatever it is, uh, that's been me, that's defined me. Yes, you're right. And, and do you think that's why you have an experience burned out? Because you you can you can see what's coming down and change and adapt to be able to survive in the next generation. Well, many people are stuck in this is the way I've always done it, and the pushback is tremendous. Hmm. Yes, change change is very incremental in medicine in particular, and we know that. And to go from evidence to practice may take as long as 17 years. We saw that with cholesterol, and it may be it's down to 10 years now, but people are very resistant to change. They create their patterns. They like to stay within them. For me, it was always a challenge to live up to the expectation and exceed it. Uh, maybe that was an issue that goes back to my primal psychological makeup, but whatever it is, it's what's driven me in the course of my practice. So... Yeah, I think it's just that drive uh, to be competent, to be capable, and to never think that, 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 that to me, the weakness and the burnout would be if I couldn't do it. Uh, whereas for many, it's, um, I can't do the other things I want to do, therefore I'm burned out. There's lots of co contributory factors and they're a very individual phenomenon. But yeah, you're right. It is uh, a little bit more emblematic of, uh, of the, the pressures and the problems that we see in medicine. And you had a TV show and then you had a radio show. What advice do you have for two newbies who are trying to do this? <laughs> well, you know, there, there, there are two things. One, of course, is preparation. There, you can never be too prepared. I would always assume that my guests, because most of these were um, guest type shows and not just editorial presentations, but actually having either a physician who I would interview to learn about their specialty and give them an opportunity to shine, or an audience show where I would have a group of patients and their loved ones in an audience and talk about a disease process with a specialist there to complement that information. But either way, you had to be able to do the whole show on your own, realizing that you don't know how people are going to behave when you get them on the air. They may be completely closed mouth. You may have to give the answer and have them agree and then find some way to get them to continue to develop their answer. So yeah, the biggest thing is preparation. When you do radio, especially when you don't have that visible connection, uh, then you can't have silence either. And that even makes it more difficult. I remember when I would do the radio show, I, I actually would go into the studio back then. <laughs> That's how you had to do them. Uh, but I would have all kinds of prepared statements knowing when I was going out for a commercial and coming back from the commercial or talking about a show next week that I would literally have the text and I would tape up maybe a dozen different notes around my microphone so that I could just look at them and just spit it out when the time came because you are working on a clock when you're doing that. And you don't want to mess up and, and like stop mid-sentence as the network news comes on. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah. yeah, I think preparation is it. And then to have joy, to be positive and, and you know, have a voice that is a little musical in a way that keeps a, a, a listener involved, engaged. Sometimes you never know. Is anybody listening? I, I remember when I was doing the uh, WMAL thing, uh, the ABC radio in DC, I would never know if anybody was listening. Uh, I would think, who could be listening? But then they would have something like, uh, the first 20 callers will get free tickets to the auto show. It was like, what? And all of a sudden, the lights would just start banging on. I mean, just the phone lines would just ring off the, off the hook. So I figured there gotta be at least 10 people listening. <laughs> Oh, funny. And I guess there's something show, similar to what we're doing, Herb, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. But, his, but his shows were live. So oh, they were no, live also. But there That's was no editing. Shows. I, had, I actually had the opportunity to uh, interview Larry King as my guest on an hour show in heart disease. Uh, Larry had uh, heart disease. He had uh, coronary bypass surgery. And he wrote a book about uh, Hollywood movie stars who also had heart disease. 
And so he wanted to promote that and he arranged uh, with someone I was working with to do uh, a show. Okay. So I had him and his cardiologist and you know, that was with a, a feather in the cap. He really was an interview to me. He smoked a lot, didn't he? Larry King smoked a lot. He did. He had the voice that proved it too. Yeah. Yeah, that really does a number in your coronary arteries. Russ, you, you have been very influential through organized medicine, whether it's at the Medical Society of Virginia, the Medical Society of Northern Virginia, the AAP, or the AMA. What lessons have you learned that you can share with the younger audience about being involved in organized medicine? Because it seems from my perspective that that is a marathon, not a sprint. And you've got it right there. There's no way... You can be an effective leader without creating the network of compatibility and Russ, understanding the mission. Russ, Russ, that there's your voice is kind of cutting out a little bit. I'm not sure. It may be my computer's going through some process, but um, it should be hardwired. You hear me okay? I hear you, but I hear like an echo, a little bit of an echo. Uh, well, it, it sounds like it's, uh, let me see if there's something here that I can get to maybe that will make it better. Um, didn't do it, did it? Did it? No, we, we can keep going. We'll, we'll fix it with AI. Right. So yeah. I'll go back to the question. So, so Ross, so you're very involved. It seems to me like it's more of a marathon than a sprint. What lessons could you share with younger people? Well, let's say... If you want to affect change, you can scream all you want, but there are only a few people who are going to hear it. If you can create it, an outlet, a network, and a credible source, you have a much better chance. To be able to be a credible participant in that source, you have to spend the time creating the relationships, establishing your credibility, and to understand the issues for which you are advocating. Uh, some of that you can learn, some of that you can intuit, but most of that you have to work at. Um, and it takes time to gather the expertise to be able to create the cohesive messages that you feel are important to support your cause. So yeah, you have to start somewhere. And that's probably the hardest thing for people to do because uh, it means extra time, it makes, means extra commitment, and it means uh, extra learning so that you do have an understanding of the issues you're representing. Does money play a role in that? Money does not play a role in that, no. Uh, this is uh, part of that commitment to, to your profession. There are many who are motivated because they feel that's a way that they can advocate for something that may ultimately um, give them some return on investment. Um, you know, whether it's... Um, Related to uh, not having to spend the time for um, doing a maintenance of certification, or there are things that people go after. Um, so even these... more in to get to the policymakers, do you always have to be have money on the table for them to listen? Well, that's that's a good question. It depends on the policymaker. It depends on the policy, and it depends on what they are going to get from that policy. So. If it's about scope of practice and you want to talk to a legislator, uh, they're going to listen to you if you have a PAC or you as an individual have made contributions or if you're a constituent who may uh, have some influence on a, on a body of, of voters. Yeah, they, um, it, it is an indirect way, uh, but certainly money drives politics and politics seeks out money because it seems that uh, that's the way they are, are financing their campaigns. That's the way they generate the interest and uh, awareness. And uh, and a lot of times you sort of feel like you have to buy influence because people don't know the issues and they're going to vote on them. Uh, it makes it yeah. a little awkward when you're looking at, uh, at policy issues, at least at the legislative level. I think one of my um, fondest members of talking to you was while well, we were up in Richmond. And you told me about, I think he was a Republican that's been in the House or the Senate for a long time. And he's the best filibuster ever. He will he will clap you on the back and tell you stories and stories for the 15 minutes you're scheduled with him. Take the check, hug you, and say goodbye to you. I don't know. Got you, it. You're right. <laughs> and you yeah. know, 
you barely get to say your name. Yes, and that that would represent someone who's been around the block a few times and knows how to manage what your expectations might be. Uh, you end up doing a lot of your policy discussions with the administrative aid and not actually the uh, the representative, uh, whether it be a senator or a congressman, and whether it be at the state or the the, the national level. Uh, it is usually those policy specific aides who decide what they're going to say and why. Occasionally there's an issue that they may feel elevates them in the perception of their voters or the public and they'll take it on directly. But most of the time it's through these intermediaries and you just hope that what you say gets translated in a way that supports your position. Yeah. Doesn't sound you? quite fair. Right. Well, that's politics. It's, it is not fair. And we see a lot of manipulation uh, in all kinds of settings. Uh, it can be pretty frustrating, but that's the system we deal with. Uh, ultimately, it's better than any other system I've, I've observed. Um, and I think uh, as frustrating as it may be, we have to continue to strive to make it better. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, everything is fair in love and war, right? <laughs> if you're not there, nothing happens, right? You can complain all you want. I mean, that was the story with organized medicine. You talk to doctors in the doctor's lounge back when docs used to hang out there at the hospital, but they don't complain about this policy and that policy and the way insurance does this or that. And, and it would grumble and grumble and that would be it. It would be all in the doctor's lounge. And if you want to see things change, you have to get involved. So People will say, I don't like that medical organization. They don't represent me or my issues. And I say to them, well, then you have to join, become a leader and change how they represent the issues that are important to you. Or create your own. Or create your own, right, yes. You know, that, can, that can be a little bit more, uh, let's say, Stop arduous. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a lot of work. Now, you you have been on the on the board of the Physician Foundation since its inception. And from what I understand is this was born out of a settlement with uh, U.S. Health, healthcare uh, back when that was a health plan before Edna. Is that correct? Well, it was like this. Um, managed care was a concept that came out of a meeting called the Jackson Hole Group. Um, and that was gee, back in the late 60s into the 70s. They conceptualized a payment system that would be based upon capitation. Can you believe that? Just dividing the risk among the population and then paying doctors based upon their customary charges over a period of time rather than on an episodic per visit basis. Uh, that evolved into the HMO and PPO uh, concepts that were really embraced and developed on the West Coast. Uh, as uh, we watched that from the East Coast, we continued with our usual indemnity, which basically uh, the, the insurance where you'd see somebody and you'd pay for it, you'd submit the bill to your insurance company and they give you a percentage back. Anyway, when the insurance companies realized there was a huge marketplace uh, and that they could insure healthy populations of employees, uh, they went after it in a big way. And so initially they developed their panels of physicians. These were closed networks. Uh, they were, quote, uh, credentialed and empowered by these insurance companies to be the provider for their patient populations. And they went after it. They did really develop some nice fee schedules. It was nice to not have to say to the patient, oh, this visit cost you $75, whatever. You could just say, oh, what's your $10 copay? Okay, and then we send the bill to the insurance company. We get the 75 bucks. But you don't have to ask or collect it at the time of service. Boy, this was a huge benefit. And so it was pretty well embraced. And the insurance companies developed all kinds of ways to devise plans that would be attractive to employers. And they built these huge insurance groups, Aetna, Cigna, Prudential, WellPoint, Anthem, you name it. They all started to, to take advantage of this opportunity. As time went on, they started to then substitute contracts that paid us less and never informed us until they started paying us less. And then that didn't work if you appealed it. 
Uh, they would also do things because all of it was submitted on paper, they would lose the paper or they would just reduce the fee they had arranged to pay you by $5, whatever it was. It became remarkable how they were manipulating and actually uh, stealing from patients and doctors. Then they started to refuse to provide care for patients. And this whole litany of, of really egregious business practices became quite obvious. In some states, they actually uh, started to control the markets and would coll collude together between plans, and sometimes between plans within plans like the blues, to say, this is our boundary. If you're going to charge that, we're going to charge this, and so on and so on, ultimately becoming subject to RICO lawsuits. And somewhere in the early 2000s, we filed lawsuits in a few states, which then were nationalized into uh, full uh, national class actions. And ultimately, every physician in the country was in that class. Uh, the outcome of that was a, a remarkable set of settlements. Eight companies settled on this. You can go to hmosettlements.com if you want to read about it. But ultimately, they promised to correct their business practices to start to receive their um, uh, their EOBs or their, their let's say, uh, you would have electronic submissions for your claims. And thereby, we were able to more or less monitor and have a more concise way of, of seeing how they were paying and that they were doing it in a timely fashion. There were many other facets to this, but another part of it was to send money out to doctors for past acts, which was minimal, you know, four or five hundred dollars a piece, but to 700,000 700, physicians. At the same time, we created an, a foundation, the Physicians Foundation, and I won't get into all those details, but ultimately many people reverted their checks back to the foundation. And ultimately we started this organization with close to $100 million. And this was in, incorporated in 2003. We basically, with no strings attached, are there to help support physicians in practice, provide better care for their patients. That doesn't mean with direct payment to them, but to do things that help them survive and thrive in their practice environments. Um, currently, uh, 20 years later, we've probably given away 80 plus million dollars in research, uh, in uh, grants to different organizations who find ways to help improve and do the research or set up the programs that help support doctors in practice so that they can feel there is a future. Uh, we have probably a um, hundred million dollars remaining uh, in our, uh, our corpus and we continue to do that. Our areas of, of true focus now are physician well-being, uh, physician practice, uh, the physician's perspective on policy and uh, social drivers of health as well as leadership, which has been a core value and, uh, and commitment on our part to support the development of physician leaders so that they can have the opportunity to participate in their communities and drive physician-led healthcare evolutions. There you go. And, wow. um, and so what kind of, do you put programs to, uh, that is not the right word, uh, right. Brain is a word people put that use a lot, but I don't think you can train a leader. But do you do you have programs to help educate and inform young physicians who want to be leaders, or how do you do that mission? You know, and that that's it's a good question, and certainly it's not one that has a pat answer. But when it comes right down to it, physicians need to understand leadership if they want to preserve their. Uh, their profession and to enhance the value of the work that we do for our patients and our society, you have to be an effective leader. You're educated and capable of taking what you do professionally into a setting whereby you can help to drive the policy and the opportunity for the right decisions to be made to support patients, patient care, and our profession. So when you think about leadership, it is Identifying those who are willing to learn some of the, uh, the some of the culture, the traits, and the uh, the networking that you need to be able to be an effective leader, and we have helped support state medical organizations in developing leadership programs. 
as well as creating um, a national uh, approach to leadership that allows for collaboration and a more elevated and educated opportunity. Very interesting. Um, so you help to try to, yeah, you're like us, elevating great physicians. Right, you got them. it. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and then uh, on the wellness space, yeah. you've been on this for many years now. Right. What are the, the key lessons you've learned from working with other people that want to maintain a healthy workforce? Because in my mind, one of the biggest mistakes we have made as a society is we don't invest enough in our mothers. We don't invest in enough in our pediatricians. And if you don't have a healthy mom and you don't have a healthy pediatrician and a healthy school teacher, you can't raise the next, next generation. So what have you learned that impacts this wellness on physicians? You're talking about two different issues here and both of which I have very strong opinions and have tried to, to do everything I can to help. Um, I will say that from the point of view of um, what to do with kids and their settings, Hi, Mary. I know. It's so good to see Mary in the background. Yes. Um, all right. So, so what do you learn about the wellness of, of, of yeah. so decisions? Wellness, and decisions. I could talk to you a bit about wellness, but I'm going to talk about um, the care of mothers and children because I really think that we have been relegated to a basement bedroom as pediatricians in the house of medicine. And it's time for us to have our own house. So one of my areas of advocacy as a physician leader has been to try to drive an awareness and understanding of the value of what we bring, not just to our patients in an immediate sense, but to society and the cost of healthcare over time. That has never been appreciated. Right now, the cost basis in healthcare is assessed on a year to year basis. It looks at chronically ill adult patients as that source of cost and is always addressing how can you create a value-based system that rewards improving the efficiency and consistency of care for those chronic and expensive conditions. When in fact, if you could do that in a pediatric population, you wouldn't have those persistent and expensive chronic conditions at nearly the rate nor expense that they currently are. So that investment will give you at four to one return on investment, whereas the one focusing on adults gives you about a 0.25 to one investment return. So we're fighting a losing battle consistently, yet we're not investing in where we can have the best bang for our buck and create a better world around us. So, so that's been something that has taken time to be able to establish the credible evidence to support and then to get the buy-in through leadership. We have gotten a commitment this year from the AAP they have made this a priority. They recognize this, this is an issue and that in their most recent leadership forum have decided this is in the top two of our commitments over the next set of years. So that's one thing. Secondly, we just got back from the AMA meeting and the AMA has been an advocate and supported all of the CMS initiatives to help drive Medicare, but won't approach Medicaid which is the insurer of 70 plus percent of the population of kids, nor the mothers that deliver those kids. And we were actually able to, to pass policy and advocacy and action plans to help support this initiative that we created at the AAP, which is all about understanding the value and enhancing the way we get paid as the pediatrician so that we can sustain our practices and continue to improve the care and outcomes uh, for our patients. Do you think that the reason why a lot of outside forces don't respect pediatricians is because we as physicians think what we do is easy. So it's not that big of a deal. We give shots, we have runny noses, and we have meningitis every now and again, an asthmatic every now and again. You know, George, I think it's all about the fact that it doesn't cost anything and why bother? So, you know, if we're 20 plus percent of the population, but under 6% of the cost. Actually, cares. 3%. Cares. That's, and that's how they've always approached it. 
there's no long-term thinking, there wasn't adequate evidence. But in fact, if we want a healthier society, one that can afford to keep Medicare uh, fluid, uh, you're gonna have to approach it from a, a preventative point of view. And that's what we do. And I do think that we are the altruists in the medical profession. We are the ones who are willing to sacrifice ourselves at the expense of our own pleasures and, and income. And uh, we've taken it thus far, but the fact is uh, we can't sustain our practices. We've seen through COVID, the cost of operating go up 15%, yet we may get a 2% increase in payment. So all of a sudden we're net, uh, you know, 12 or 15% under our costs in no time. You can't operate. You're going to go out of business. But you know what? Medicine is a business. The insurance it's company, a it's a business. Yep. The synagogue I, I was, is a business. What's that? The synagogue, temple's a business. I the know. Church but, is but a business. What, what does the if church... They don't get the, money, if they don't get money, they can't pay the bills. The yeah, but what does, what does the synagogue and the church do? They go and ask. Right? Most physicians feel that you should give it to me. You should give me a raise. I've asked the insurance companies where I did some negotiations and I had asked them, oh, you gave us a raise? Why? He says, well, because you asked. Most people don't. Well, the, the real issue is when you go to increase your rates, they ask you to identify the 10 that you want to increase. And yeah. then they decrease the another 10 or give you a 3% increase. A game. So it, it is a game and, and that's not the way it should be. It should be something that creates much more enduring value and invests in our ability to provide that value. It but if you provide it. value, they see it and they know Herb had helped me with a couple of uh, negotiations and right. we were kind of successful, but we had to prove, we had to prove value. Yeah. The, 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 the real problem, and I think Ross has said it, and, and we heard a lot of our guests say, it, and I say this, you know, uh, ice cream a lot. And I say, um, it's not spend, it's value, investment. We are not investing enough in our mothers and our children. Medicaid is not an insurance policy, despite of what the AAP statement says. Medicaid is a safety net program that mostly benefits the uh, people who are disabled or duly insured in Medicare and Medicaid, which is the elderly who are in nursing homes. Well, we can't kick out and throw them in into the street like we did people with mental health after Kennedy started closing down. Um, mental health institutions and never funded outpatient uh, treatment. Um, we need a different solution. And I'm very aggrieved at this policy statement from the AAP, despite of all their great wishes um, and all their good intentions. And finally, after 30 years of being a pediatrician, the AAP has woken up and realized that if there are no pediatricians, there is no access to care. So you can just might as well throw into the wastebasket DEI. Um, and that is not just general pediatricians, that is pediatric hospitals, uh, pedi uh, children's hospitals, uh, every pediatrics of specialty is hurting, and it's all a revenue problem. There is not enough money to sustain the infrastructure and having this, quote, aspirational dream that every child in the U.S. will be on Medicaid and puts all all of us out of our out of business. Just I I I I just I I I just can't know what I just can't understand it. We should be asking for a hundred and fifty percent of Medicare at a minimum for our re, for our payment for our services and some mode of this me, uh, certified medical home payment per patient in your panel to maintain infrastructure in the community neighborhood pediatric office and the, and the children's hospitals. We cannot do it at 100% of Medicare. We certainly cannot do it at 75%. Uh, we cannot do it like New York at 45% of Medicare. It is just not viable. Yeah. And why anybody would put that on a policy statement and publish it, sorry, can't figure it out. Well, there are some states that do cover at 100% of Medicare, and the best years 
in New York was when there was parity with Medicare, with the Medicaid. But that's no longer enough, George, because Medicare- I know that. I mean, increasing I mean, reimbursement for the last 15 years because there's not enough money for the end-of-life care that we're spending money on. Yeah. Well, that's- It's true we that the fee-for-service and the volume and margin mentality, and all you do is try to find ways to increase your volume your procedures and your margins and that ends up being really counterproductive yeah but we need a we need a different conversation yep. a conversation that starts with we need to invest in our young yeah and that means again i know i'm a, ro a broken record that means moms moms need pre pre good prenatal care yep. you know that means school teachers I cannot, I can keep you healthy vaccinating you, but if you can't read and write, you're not going to have much of a future. And when you, you, so you have a triad there, or you do, you have the social, the educational, and the medical. And um, you need to be able to separate that out from the healthcare finance system and create its own value and its own independent funding in a way that can sustain the care and the investment in that future. And I agree. It's, Eternal child. Yeah, it's 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 not one thing. It's all of it, and, right. and you know, and it's not a one year or one quarter. I mean, I don't I don't mind Sanofi. I don't mind Merck, because if they weren't around, if Merck wasn't around, I wouldn't have an HPV vaccine to give the kids. I need them. I'm a libertarian, but I need the federal government because without VFC. The children that are not insured would not get vaccines. And likewise, they need me. Because if I don't put that needle in that thigh, it doesn't get done. So we all have our words, but we're all working for a common interest. And that's to leave a better society. And, and we need to start talking about what does it take, all of us, to make this country, which is already a wonderful country, be here not just for our children, but for our grandchildren and be an example for the world. And we're not having that conversation. And we need to start having that conversation. Sorry, it just, it really yeah. irritates me when we don't value our young. Agreed fully. And, uh, you know, and once again, that gets back to leadership. Because you can think those thoughts, you can even express them, but until you start to figure out how you can organize it in a way that does affect change, uh, it's just a conversation. Um, and once again, as I mentioned before, to me, um, you know, solving a problem becomes the next problem. Uh, it is not ever static. It's always evolving and you can always do better. And I think that uh, we've done well in some ways, but we really have a long ways to go before we are making the contribution that we are capable of making and get valued the way we should be valued. Yeah. Yeah, our work isn't easy. I mean, it is not easy. It's it's not as hard as some other people. I mean, I, every time I see the, the, the people that collect the trash, I think that's really hard work. They're out there in such cold weather and it's rainy, you know, and that truck stinks and they're on that truck from five in the morning till five in the afternoon. Uh -huh. To me, that's really hard work. We have. Oh, well, we went to school, so we don't have to do that hard work. Yeah. But we have, have hard work. But we have many days that are, you know, full of joy with the kids and it's fun. Yeah. We, it's we rapid also, fire. And Pete's is rapid privileged. fire. No question. But we, but we also have some days like last week where, um, I sent a, a child to the ER and he has a, a tumor in his brain. And he's not going to live. That's part of uh, the those, those catastrophic moments are really, really hard to, to internalize. Um, but that's the beauty and the resilience that we have. Um, and we could talk, you know, we were going to talk about wellness a little bit, but uh, that is an issue to me that really does magnify the difference between early career and medical students, um, early career positions and medical students, and those who have been in practice and feel burned out based upon uh, the trials, tribulations, demands, and issues around being in practice. 
because I think people come into the field with certain intrinsic experiences, expectations, and altruism that can be initially rather, uh, let's say, decimated by the system, the way we practice, the way we educate, and how we deal with each other. And that can be a very, uh, let's say, difficult transition for many to make. And unless you have that resiliency that we talk about, well-being 1.0, the, the good old, you know, work until you drop doc. Uh, and now there's a different context. And it's not that there's any individual that should be vilified. It's not the health system expert. It's not the venture capitalist. It's, it's creating some community around the well-being of physicians and the workforce. You can't isolate us from the workforce. We can lead the workforce if we're effective. But that's a whole other conversation we could do another hour about. We'll have you yeah. come back. Come back. Love it. So I, I think one of the most rewarding things, and this is, you know, the podcast has been um, in some ways a way to prevent burnout for George and I. It, it is, you know, it, it has been a, a wealth right. of joy. Yes, good. Excellent. And, but I think we need more. And the very smart psychologist or mental health expert says, say that one of the panic re response that the human brain has is alliance, allegiance. So you can either choose to run, sit still, you know, or you can go gather more of your own to protect yourself and your tribe. And I think one of the most important things that we need to do as physicians is talk to each other. Go back into these lounges, the uh, real world CME, um, the podcast, all these places where you can have conversations with people and learn from people that have done things before we were there, learn from people who are young and still have dreams and um, just not feel so disconnected from each other because that isolation, that loneliness will drive you to lose it. We tend to focus on ourselves. We tend to focus from our perspectives. And unfortunately, that has become a, a disease in this world almost. Um, in fact, um, when we look at younger physicians, they are, they are, they haven't even achieved a baseline from which they make those comparisons that we are looking back on. And their standards will be very much different from ours and understanding where they're starting, understanding what's going to impact them in the future. It's not easy to predict, but that's the greatest opportunity for mentorship and learning. Uh, mentorship is is not always a giving process. It's often a give and take process. You're giving what you know, but you're also learning what's important to those you're mentoring. And if you don't listen, you don't learn. And if you uh, don't make yourself available, you'll have no opportunity to do it. So yeah, it is... Uh, it's a time where you have to put yourself in places where you have that opportunity. For me, it's it's been doing scholarships at my medical school uh, and offering to be a mentor for those students who receive those scholarships. Uh, working at the AMA with medical students, helping them promote the ideals and the values that they embody and, and uh, come to the uh, forum with suggestions for the AMA. Some of them constructive and re remarkable, others almost laughable, but nonetheless, you learn about what's important to them. Truly. You know what's interesting? Um, I'm a priest at our office has a rotation for pediatrics for the medical school NYIT in Long Island. So all the most of the doctors, the senior doctors, all have a student every month for 10 months. And I have a student, and it's a lot of fun. You you get to teach them. They engage. When they start pediatrics, when they start the rotation, I ask them, what do you want to do? I want to do surgery, GYN, family medicine. I've never, I've never met anybody that wanted to do peds. I've been doing this for three years. At the end of the rotation, they thank me because I never thought pediatrics could be like this. This is not what they tell me. So there are a couple that may be doing pediatrics in the future. We'll, we'll see. But the interesting thing is I get enjoyment out of it. They help me. They write some notes for me. This week, I was supposed to start a new student yesterday. She called me last week saying, I have to go to California for Thanksgiving. I want to see my parents. I haven't seen them in a year. Do you think I could start my rotation next month? Next week? I said, sure. It's a half a week anyway. And I'm off on Tuesday. I was bored yesterday. Right. I was like almost depressed. I had no student. 
I had nothing. I mean, I was just seeing patients. It was like terrible, terrible, terrible. Yeah, no, they are, uh, they can be, let's say they're a redeeming experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could see why people get burnt out. Because it's all you'd, if all I had to do was what I did yesterday, it'd be terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of us really enjoy seeing the kids, so George. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, yeah, you go in, another runny nose, another rapid strap, another COVID test. Yeah, yeah well, a long time ago, I, you know, this is, uh, this shows my total lack of humility. Um, a long time ago, I realized I knew what I need. I needed to know as a pediatrician. You know, I, I don't. I don't. The, the the problems are not that much compl that complex because I've seen them so many times. But it's a joy of seeing the parents and the kids that yeah. sustains you. Um, you know, and that's much more interesting in the exam room once you master the basics of pediatrics. You know, there's curveballs every day. Yeah. Um, so like Russ. So, yeah, like the brain tumor. Like the brain tumor. But you know what? Even with the brain tumor, that was a sad story that you had because it turned out to be a malignant brain tumor. But mm -hmm. I can turn on the flip side. Three years ago, I had the same scenario where it looked like a tumor I sent her with rule out brain tumor. It was a it was a brain tumor, but it was a benign brain tumor. And I saw that girl yesterday without my student for her checkup, and she's doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can guarantee you in 10 years, the only way she'll remember you is if you were the first one to see her in the hospital. And, and I was, <laughs> and I was, <laughs> and I was. I, 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 I've done all kinds of things, but that is, as you said, that is the most memorable thing yeah. that people retain about yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then Ross, um, I got, I got two ask. One, well, the first task is, uh -huh. I, I think that, you and uh, George and uh, Wendy Hunter from California should play at the Sopum uh, Social in Orlando. We have our own little pediatric, two guitarists and a drum player. How does that fit you? Um, I think it would be great if we had some time to practice together, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm quite the musician that I could just show up and improvise easily um, without feeling some stress. Uh, for performance, but uh, can you practice over Zoom? No. Yeah, you can a yeah, little bit, can. but not very well. Yes. <laughs> yep. And then, um, in a more serious thought, is you know, as you know, we, we all get to a point, and you're far from it, but we all get to a point where our careers end, and then another life starts. Um, what do you see as the future of pediatrics and your role as? Maybe you set, set more into the skiing and the guitar playing and, and artistic side again of your life and not so much into the practice of peds. I think anybody who's done what we do with the drive that we do it will find that they have never put that kind of energy into a hobby and you can't fill your days with that hobby. So I think that uh, your social relationships are really important, your relationship with your kids, grandkids, if you have them. Uh, that's a huge piece of where you go. Um, staying as physically active as you can is really important. I, I truly believe that telemedicine is that, let's say, that stepping stone to retirement that allows you to preserve and sustain your uh, practice and skills for another few years uh, as you don't feel the stress of traffic and other office demands, but you can give important hours and get the feedback. I've never had such positive feedback that I have doing telemedicine. Patients aren't stressed. They haven't had to leave work. They haven't had to do things uh, that put them in harm's way, like drive through traffic or a sick waiting room. Uh, they're just there. They can be busy doing things in their house, in their waiting room, not yours. And uh, you encounter them, you give them the information they need, you do pretty much everything you could have done in the office and uh, take care of them, they're happy. And that to me is such a remarkable reward. Yeah. yeah. But is there really enough volume to sustain a full doctor? No, let's put it this out. way. Uh, during COVID, yes, it was full volume. Uh, and prior to that, there was about 3% volume. Um, so you went a huge leap into the technology and the capability a lot of docs feel I can't generate the relationships, I can't generate the revenue, and therefore I can't do this. Uh, 
but they aren't thinking about the big picture nor what the consumer is going to expect and demand. Yeah. Uh, when it comes right down to it, to take a whole day off of work so I can come see you, George, for 10 minutes or five, whatever it is for you to, to say, yeah, you need some eye drops for that conjunctivitis. <laughs> and I can't prescribe it without seeing you because I don't generate the revenue without doing that. Hell, you know, I, you want me to drive with my kid who's throwing up and has 103 fever because you won't talk to me on the phone and, and tell me that they look sicker than they should and have to come in. But, you know, I, there's just so many ways that, that this makes a difference. And as you integrate it into your practice, yeah. you can extend hours, you can extend it careers, yeah. and you can generate revenue. And That's what I was thinking up. to do in our practice yeah. to have uh a virtualist because right now we do them in between patients sometimes yeah. they're inconvenient it's hard, it's hard yeah. to do yep. um you know but i don't want to do it with my own staff my own yeah. physician group the younger physicians i don't think are comfortable enough to do just sick visits on that you need a third party outside physician from a different state yeah, I've had somebody in mind yeah. but that for somebody does not want to get a new york license you know who that somebody is? <laughs> oh yeah, I would imagine it's uh, someone who lives. Yeah, who lives. Uh, I wanted it as a proof of concept. <laughs> yeah, right. but uh, I heard it's really hard to fill out an application for a New York State license. <laughs> well, you could pay for it. He might consider it. Um, I even did. I even said I'll fill it out. <laughs> you know, it's um, it's one of those things that uh, unless you, well, unless you do it, you don't realize it. I, I, have, I have two great clinicians who I bought back from retirement yeah. and are thriving, loving it. When, yeah. And you know what I did, I, I basically moved to Snowmass, Colorado. I don't even own a home where I practice, but I have a license and a practice there. So um, I live in the mountains, ski, hike, bike, whatever makes me happy uh, and make that time every day while I still will see 18, 20 patients uh, through telemedicine. Wow. Wow. Good concept. You can do it. I know yeah. you can do it. I can do it. No problem. That's in next year's to do list. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I do think that's it. That's the future. Everything you pointed out is right. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've i been saying this for 25 years. Like, you, you don't need to go to your tax account and ask him a tax question. Uh, e even before faxes and Zoom and all of this. You just mail them the documents and they took care of it. Um, but because of the billing rules, we have, we were forced to have you come into the office to with the most simple problems to solve it. Otherwise we wouldn't get paid for it. Um, now that that's changed, I think, you know, we can do a better job. Listen, I, those evening calls, those weekend calls, you can turn into revenue instead of having to feel angry that you were disturbed by a parent who was worried about their kid having a 100.1 temperature. Yes, yes, yes. Well, Ross, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Libby. And when will we see you again? When will you see me again? Gosh, um, well, I won't be at the MSNVA celebration, unfortunately. Um, but um, I'm sure there will be places and times somehow, uh, at very least next year, where is it, uh, in Orlando? Orlando. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, one of my least favorite venues for the AAP. But um, maybe we'll be able to meet in San Diego thereafter or someplace that's a little bit more uh, well, San Diego, to San Diego has a CME conference. The NCE, yeah. Oh, they have one there, yes. Uh, uh, the AP is putting one out next year in, uh, okay. in San Diego. Right. Yes. Yeah, yes. I can't say that um, there are many of those CME conferences left in me, but, um, you know, we do the best we can. Anyway, it's a pleasure being with you guys. Love you guys. Like with his uh, colleagues and friends and uh, enjoy the time that we did have together uh, last month. Uh, that was great. Um, we could talk about that, George. Pediatric Executive Development System, or PEDS, is a dynamic, transformative program designed to accelerate the growth and development of the leaders in the field of pediatric entrepreneurship. P 
BEDS takes a hands-on approach to problem solving, addressing real-time situations within your organization. More than a theoretical course, it is a practical platform that accelerates learning. Look at our link on the show notes for more information.